Peter Chapano was oh my god, she was amazing. Nine in Australia. Peter Chapano was great at, at Her Majesty's Theatre. Yeah. Oh yes, not to, what boy, I was there for a week. Or, I don't know two. Weeks. I never wanted to leave. I didn't want to come home. <laughs> we we were good to you. Oh, better than yeah. good. I've worked with uh, Joanne uh, Robinson. Yes, of course, Joanne. 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 Yes, and. I have to say, I am so excited to meet you because oh, well, after seeing that you. production of Nine, wasn't that amazing? Oh God! And wasn't wasn't they were all John, every single one? Yeah, every single one. Was so, and, and Sydney was so great then. Oh my yeah. God! You just jump. We, I went out to Manly Beach. Yeah, I, went, I cuddled a koala. <laughs> uh, we, we went to Bondi. Now, now, what is Maury Eston doing here in London? Well, I, I'm here obviously because uh, uh, Tom and Danielle and I were sort of we become a triumvirate. Yes. You know, uh, I, when, when we were, I suggested that they do this ensemble version of Titanic that yes. I had cobbled together. Yes. And it was usually successful. And like, I had to come to see it. Obviously. Yes. And we became great friends. It's fantastic. A and then, uh, and then uh, they wanted to do Grand Hotel. And so we did that, and I had to come see it again. And uh, we all had this great idea that we could come into this space at the Charing Cross Theatre, which is an ideal space for uh, this show because the show is an explosion of huge music in a very small space is exciting and so it makes you feel like you're there on yes. the ship and it's yeah. happening yeah uh, and uh, and and now we're going to do death takes a holiday in the same space so i will be back for that right. so i want to see i want to see how Takes a holiday hasn't been staged much, has it? It's only in no, no, no. Uh, it was it was uh, staged in New York. It was a very yeah. great success. It was yeah. nominated for eleven drama desk awards, mm -hmm. and then it's been done in locally in, in yeah. Chicago and, and California and things like that. But this will be the UK premiere of that takes a holiday. Lovely, very exciting. Yeah, I've listened to it. It is beautiful. Thank you. It is beautiful. When you write, there's not a lot of writers that actually write music and lyrics. Yeah. I imagine if you are able and you... It's a very you, small club. Yes, it's, you are more than able. I imagine if you're not able, um, then it makes it difficult because you have to collaborate with another writer. Well, if you, you are able, it probably makes things easier, does it? Well, I will... Like, well, it's, I, it's, it's, it's hard and easy even whether you're doing that or not. I mean, I, just, I love, of course, the great Frank Lesser and Cole Porter and, and Stephen Sondheim and mm. all those great poets. I, it just never, never seemed to me not to do that. It was mm. I, somehow I always did, but you know, I started. I studied in a, in a music theater BMI workshop when I was uh, started out, and Alan Menken was in that workshop. Ed Kleban was in that workshop. Ed wrote a chorus line. Alan, I do know what happened. I, I had actually introduced him to Howard Ashman, and that, <laughs> that's how that happened. But You're you know, responsible. But you know, I took over that workshop when the man who taught it died. I did it for 20 years, and you know, I, I said, you know, Aaron, so I think you should work with Flaherty, uh, and so I, I, I'm very conscious of what the nature of the collaboration is for a lyricist and a, and a composer. I mean, somebody asked me, why do I write lyrics? And I, I didn't have any answer except, I guess, I'm neurotic in that direction. Right. <laughs> but, mm. uh, and, and so in, in my head, when I, I see a character and I, and I, what's that character thinking? I not only feel the music that's inside, but I hear the internal monologue. Right. And what their thoughts are. Okay. Um, from someone reading about you and someone who has watched you from afar, like me, is a great fan, it seems like you are inspired by um, film, very much. Okay, very much. Well, well, and by everything yeah. actually. But is that but because it's visual and it helps paint those pictures, and then you can go away and? and I, well, you know, it's funny. I, 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 I let me, I'll, let me, go, I'll go all academic on you here. You know, uh, Wagner, uh, his great dream was to create, you know, this, this c complete combination of all the arts. He called it the Gesamtkunstwerk. <laughs> in other words, it's got it's got sculpture, it's got poetry, it's got music, it's got drama, it's got everything, and so uh, and film really has become that, hasn't it? I yeah. mean, it's 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 uh, even down to the CGI. In, in other words, yeah. it's it's this limitless ability from every. It, the only thing we're not getting is smell at the moment. We'll <laughs> probably get that. They talked about it. Uh, they've talked about it, and so. Uh, but what I find is that that when when I go back, to me, the medium that communicates the most of all is music. Mm. Because music not only gives you, you, you feel, you, you listen to Debussy, you feel the sea, you can taste the salt mm. in the air. Uh, and, uh, 
and it, it, it touches upon the complexity of emotions. Mm. And it does something that no other art really does. Mm. It creates a simultaneity. You could have three things going on, you hear them all. And that means that I can do that on the stage. I can three people having three different thoughts, simultaneous, and the music will make us comprehend those things. That conversation in Titanic between the, yes, that's the a good captain. That's right. I, I was watching that again. I mean, I'd seen it before. Right. And, and in this production of Titanic, I just thought that is just... And there's a duet between the Stoker and the radio yes. man. Because he wants to, he, the Stoker wants to uh, uh, propose to his girlfriend. He's mm. afraid she, she, won't, she won't come back. And they, mm. they create this bond between mm. them in that it's a duet. And they both sing their part at the same time. So why Death Takes a Holiday? Is this, is this oh. more based on the Meet Black or the no, no, Frederick no, no, March? No, 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 no. And neither. It's based okay. on the original play by Roberto Casella in yeah. 1927. Uh, he had written it in response to so many plays were about death in the 20s because they were, they were literally traumatized by the scale of death of the First World War, mm. followed by three years of a worldwide pandemic that killed more people than the whole war did. I mean, 60 million people died worldwide from that pandemic. Mm. And here's everybody cut their hair, started drinking, and started, you know, mm. looking like flappers and dancing in the jazz age, <laughs> and just running away from mm. all that. And, and so, but the profound experience of that that of death on that scale led playwrights to investigate it. And this playwright investigated a simple question, which was, well, what about death? Um, he, and in our show, uh, Peter Stone and I decided that there's nothing religious about it. He doesn't even kill you. He doesn't make those decisions. His job is to come collect you when you die. That's his gig. And, um, and he's exhausted after the war. He's just, he's had it. He needs a break. He needs a holiday. And he wants to use that holiday because he has to answer a question that's plagued him for eons, which is, why are people so afraid of me? Right. Death, death doesn't hurt you. No. You've had a good... Why do they so... Uh, are they in such dread of me? I have to find... What is so great about life that they cling to it? I have to find out. And it just happens to be in northern Italy in the dark in this speeding car and a girl's just gotten engaged with her whole family is speeding along and the car goes into a spin and she flies out of the car at 60 miles an hour and lands in his arms and for the first time in his existence he's never seen such a power and potency of life force and he can not do his job can not collect her and he sends her back through the fog she has no idea what's happened and he comes to the house and he announces himself to the, to, the, to the head of the house and he says, keep my secret. I just want to be your house guest for two days. I promise I'll leave. While I'm here, no one will die. I just have to know what is life. Now, if that doesn't want you, if that doesn't prompt you to find out more about this show and go and say, I don't know what works. I promise works, you, they, it sounds they, like... They fall into the answer, of course, is love. That's yeah. what makes life so precious. Yeah. And, and some good and music along the way. he falls in love with her and she falls in love with him. I don't know. I, you'll have to see the show to find you, out. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, um, we, how long have you been in this business? What prompted you to be in it? Because it's a tough business. It's a crazy business. You, you know, it, 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 it's very interesting you say that. But you know, when we have, when there's a doctor, a surgeon who just does, you know, heart surgery and, and stands there for eighteen hours and does it and comes away from it, he doesn't think of it as being a tough thing. He's, no. he's the best. He's very good at it. You know, I started playing the piano when I was five. I started taking lessons. I started composing when I was six. I've never, done so it. I've never done anything else. It's just all come, it's, it's something you do. It's yeah, there's a wonderful book uh, by Alan Watts called The Wisdom of Insecurity. And I believe in that book. I, you know, everybody, to anybody, well, you know, how insecure life is that you want to write musicals. But the truth is, music has always been my best friend and the safest thing I could possibly do in my life. I would like to be here. I would like to be there. I would like to be everywhere at once. I know that's a contradiction in terms, and it's a problem. Especially when my body's clearing 40, as my mind is nearing 10. I can hardly stay up. Funnily enough, I, I, you know, I believe that writing isn't something that, something that you do. I think it's something that you are. In other words, you know, the reason I wrote nine was because I could not write it. It kept, I kept it occurring to me. I, I could have said, okay, I want to stop this. And what? then I would wake up in the middle of the night and there's, oh, what, oh I, could, I could do that. All of the characters. Everything, right. the whole thing. It occurs to you, you know. Um, the, one of the things about ad adapting things is that you, you change it. You must change it. I mean, if you're not going to change 
from the 80s, eight and a half, or figure out a way to bring yourself and get something new into the story of the Titanic, uh, then well, just raise the curtain and you know read the book or mm. show the movie. Mm. Mm. You know, so it's it's very much a matter of you're making a personal investment and giving it. The audience has to know, know two things: one, why am I in this theater tonight? Mm. Two, why should I care about this? Mm. What does this have to do with mm. my Life. Care. When I saw that little boy <laughs> in nine sing with the grown-up Guido, getting tall. I get getting tall. I get emotional just thinking about it. Do you know what's funny about that? Uh, when we first did the read, the stage reading of that up at the O'Neill Center, uh, there was a different song that ended it, and and everybody loved it, and everybody said this is really, this is really going to be so good. And it was three days before we were going to make our first presentation, and that night I couldn't sleep, and I realized. Uh, I need that song. I, I need to write a different song because I realized that this 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 Rue, this guy who's been cheating on his wife and God knows what, if if he's going to be forgiven in any way at all, he has to, he has to learn something. Mm -hmm. What what? And, and I and, and he has to learn how to grow up. And I realized I don't have anybody on stage to tell him to grow up because his wife's gone, his mother's dead, right? The priest isn't around. And I thought, oh. Who's the one person on stage who knows not only that you have to grow up, but he can't wait to grow up? And, and that's a kid. Oh. <laughs> I can't wait till I'm eight. And so, fast and forward. So, fast forward, it's in surreal time, his <laughs> former self on the stage sings to him. Beautiful. We scrape our knees, we learn how to tie our shoes, so we when, learn to grow so up. So when you see a production of Nine or Titanic, as we're in the Charing Cross yeah. Theatre and it's on at the moment, is this like giving birth to something exciting and new, and seeing a new cast and a new director? It, it initially, initially it is, but it, it's even it's even better than that because because it's not giving birth; it's watching them give birth. Right. Other, I wrote it; it's there. It's your baby. It, but you know what? They take it and yeah. they make it their own. Okay. And in, in this case, uh, for it to be in Great Britain, because this is this is your this is your story. This is a British ship. Yeah. This is the British Empire. Mm. So it has a particular place. It it just it's like a ship coming into a perfectly designed berth. The subject matter, the class divisions, the, the nature of the characters, it all just sits so beautifully in this country because every part of it is so, in, it is so osmotically understood. You know, you don't know how to say anything. It's just it's just. Tom Sutherland. Yes. Is he your hell prince to... Uh, I think Tom Sutherland is, is beyond that. I mean, what I love about him is that he lied about his age when I first met him because he, <laughs> he thought I, I wouldn't trust him being that young. But he, he, You've got to love that. I mean, you know what? A guy like that comes along every once in a great while. Yeah. And I think that he is going to be exactly who Sam Mendes became and who yeah. Nick Heitner became. I, I, he's one of those great young British directors who are apparently an endless supply in yeah. this country. And I think he's just... Brilliant, and, and he I seems think. to connect with what you were talking about before. He, we, the, the actual we stories, we, the we, voices. We, we the, click, we, yeah. and the reason we click is he has instinctual understanding of, of the nature of musical theatre and the magic that he can create. That and must be so exciting. He understands that. You know, I said something a long time ago. I said that you know, theatre is a lie, right? Uh, in which we we harpoon the imagination of the audience <laughs> in creating the illusion that's on stage. They help us. We don't have to build a ship, and the the less we need of of a set. And the more the audience will imagine it, just mm. from hearing clues in the music, mm. the more exciting the theater is. Mm. And the best part of it is, at, in this day and age, I seem to have stumbled into the, the one medium of art in which they cannot download you. Mm. You have to come to the theater and see it. That's how it works. Unless we can download people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but also, too, so exciting. I think there is something about actually being in the same room as the vibration yes. that is springing off the violin or the, the mouth. Well, of this the particular, in particular, that's mm. part of it. Part of the giganticism of Titanic is how big the music is. Yes. And in this small space, this massive amount of music, this core music, explodes. And the voices. And the voices Coming sail straight through you into, uh, into the back wall. Uh, so it's really, really thrilling. Uh, yeah. So, what's next? Well, Laurie Eston, uh, after you do a triumphant well, launch I, of Death I, Takes a Heart. We're a lot of different things, but I think the things that, that that's really closest is Tom, Thomas Meehan and I, and I love Tom Meehan. He wrote Annie, he wrote Hairspray, he wrote the producers with, his, with Mel Brooks. After Death Takes a Holiday and Titanic, 
I thought, and I spoke to Tom and I said, I, what I really want to do is a screwball romantic comedy kind of from the 40s. Okay. Because it's entertaining. Yeah. And, and the, per, the person who's most brilliant at that is the great screenwriter and director, Preston Sturgis. Yes, and, of uh, course. So we looked at all the Preston Sturgis movies, you know, the Palm Beach story. And, uh -huh. and there's one that's just brilliantly designed that, that screams to be a musical. And it's a film called The Lady Eve. And uh, so we're working on it. We're looking forward to, to putting oh, it on its feet. Must be exciting that night when you're at home and you've got the drink in hand and you're thinking, this is it. This is the screw well, yeah, we, yeah, we, we, yeah, it's, it's got Henry Fonda and Barbara Stanwyck and it's just, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, he's a screwball, a son of a, of a millionaire in Connecticut in, in the ale business. I, except that he's, he's been, uh, he's an ophiologist. He studies poisonous snakes. <laughs> he's been up the Amazon for a year. He goes onto the ship to take him back to America from South America and on the ship is Barbara Stadwick and her father and their card sharps and they're going to take all his money. Sounds Except perfect. she falls for him and he falls for her uh, and uh-oh. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, tell me, um, I'm going to ask you a very uh, unfair question. No, you're going to ask me it. And um, as a singer, I'm often asked what's my favourite song to sing. Uh -huh. What's out of all of the songs you've written? Oh God. Well, you know, I don't suppose there is one particular, but when you hear a song like Getting Tall, yeah. is there one that you think, oh my God, I did that? I can, I, you know, it's, it's a fantastic question. It is sort of unfair, but fortunately I have an unfair answer to give you. Right. My, my dad was born and, uh, and raised in London, Blackfriars Road, and his mother, uh, my grandmother, who I knew only slightly, uh, I was very little, uh, but she was, she was marvelous. She, she never learned to read. And so when she came to America and she was on the train going, for, uh, she would go to the dining car and she would say to the waiter, uh, excuse me, young man, I've forgotten my glasses. Could you read the menu to me? And my grandmother would say, would give you an answer and she would say, which song is my favorite song? She would say, it's like saying, which child is my favorite child? child. And she would answer, they're all like the fingers of your hand. Which finger would you give? Okay. So uh, that's my answer. Okay, well, I'll, I'll accept that. Now, okay. I've, got, I've got more of the listening of The Death Takes a Holiday, which I'm enjoying immensely. Uh -huh. We're looking forward to that. We've got to look forward to The Lady Eve. The Lady Eve, right. And uh, our listeners at Live Theatre UK are delighted to have had this opportunity well, to so listen to you. Well, it's so great to talk to you. It's great to miss you. I'm, right. I'm so excited right. and looking forward to it coming here. Great. Okay. <laughs>